Today I want to talk about the elephant that's currently trying to hide itself in the corner of the room, raising that dead ceiling. So let's jump right into this episode with a metaphor. You're living paycheck to paycheck, and what do you know, you just got paid. Alright, cash to burn, baby. Now unfortunately, jumping forward a bit, it's now a few weeks later and you've spent everything you've made. But you still need to make your rent and buy groceries. Your next paycheck is still a week out. So you think to yourself, gee, I have to be more financially responsible. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut up all my credit cards. Well, you still have to buy groceries and pay rent. You just no longer have any means to do so. You're just out of money with no ability to go into debt at that point. Now that paycheck to paycheck debt cycle is modern day America. Just trying to keep everything together until our next tax season by borrowing more and more money to fill in the holes. America also has a self imposed credit limit, currently set to an eye watering $31.4 trillion. Now we owe about $31 trillion, so pretty close. We got about $400 billion of debt to play around with before stuff starts getting really rough. Now I can't look into a crystal ball and give you the exact date of when things are going to hit the fan because there's actually a bit of a coasting period between when America hits that debt limit and when alarms really start to go off. You see, you start bumping up against that credit limit, and much like that paycheck to paycheck metaphor that we started our episode with. Well, our treasury department starts getting really creative with their budgeting and where they're spending that limited cash. Alright, I know I don't have to pay that guy right now so I can put off those repairs for a few weeks, but uh, let me just redirect some of that funding over here, put a little bit over here, and voila, we can coast for another 3 weeks without borrowing any money. Just, just don't cash that check until the end of the month. Now the point at which the situation flips from annoying to a CNN anchor with rolled up sleeves screaming at you is when America actually defaults on its debt payments. You see America prioritizes making payments on our debt above pretty much everything else, and those payments come in fixed installments. No moving money around to different places when those expenses come up. Miss a payment and that's considered defaulting on your debt. Now if we ever end up crossing that default line, we'll know that the federal government is flat broke and can't come up with enough cash, until of course the next tax season or congress allows himself to start borrowing more money again. So you might be hearing this analysis and saying, yeah, ok, I've lived through more government shutdowns than I can count at this point, toggling that on off switch is almost a christmas tradition at this point. Hidden that debt ceiling though, well it's in an entirely different league than a government shutdown. A league that America is yet to make it into as of the recording of this episode. Now you see, when the government shuts down, that's pretty minor stuff in the scheme of things. It's largely because congress can't agree on a new budget, so all non-essential spending is shut down. We're going to keep paying those critical employees, we're going to keep servicing the debt, and we're going to keep running our entitlement programs. We're just sort of removing any of the frills from the budget until congress can agree on what they are. Now when we bump things up and start bumping against the debt ceiling though, well, the game's over for everything. Essential and non-essential government spending are getting the kibosh. Sorry, we're just out of money. Think of it as the difference between a government shutdown, or keeping the lights on but cancelling that vacation next month, and a debt limit crisis. We're keeping the lights on until that electricity bill arrives, then gotta hope some access to cash starts shaking out. So why are we talking about this today? Well, the house leadership has recently used the 8 year old take me to Disneyland strategy for pitching Kevin McCarthy to their representatives. Can we have Kevin McCarthy as leader? No. Are you sure? Yes. Please? I'm gonna keep asking until you say yes. 
Fine, 15th time is a charm. So basically we're looking at this and saying things aren't looking great on the getting things done front. This is magnified because Kevin McCarthy has thrown the kitchen sink at it around the 5th round of voting and by the 11th he was offering up anything that wasn't constitutionally taped down. A few major concessions have been made that if strategically employed could lead to a motivated minority holding up a debt ceiling debate with that ticking timer of the debt payments being necessitated taken down. Now the first Kevin McCarthy concession in this territory is the explicit recognition that the House of Representatives will in fact leverage raising the debt ceiling in order to get cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Pen's been put to paper and that is now part of the plan. That fight is coming. Now the reason Republicans would leverage threats to the economy to achieve this is because they only control the lower house of congress. Not enough power to pass anything, but enough power to prevent anything from being passed. If you were to sit back and prevent something super important from being passed, then you might be able to get the other team to concede to some of your demands. Now of course Democrats aren't just taking this sitting down, they're watching this strategy unfold and they're saying, well doing this economic collapse and leveraging that for political concessions is in their mind economic terrorism. And they've taken the hardline position that they are not going to negotiate with these economic terrorists. Now the Democrats have their own incredibly messy standby solution to this problem if it actually emerges. There's one small trick that could allow for funding the government without collecting additional tax dollars or borrowing additional money. Turn on the old money printer and create a whole bunch of fresh money without necessitating borrowing or taxing any of it. Now there are two other more institutional concessions that Kevin McCarthy has made to the more radical elements of his coalition that will increase the probability of these negotiations going off the edge in a way that previous negotiations haven't. So first you have the radicalizing of the house rules committee. Now this committee is basically lord of the house and can do everything from straight up block proposed bills from being brought to a larger house vote to a more nuanced and hint of nutty will allow the house to get out the big paper clips and attach pages upon pages of amendments to proposed bills before they get voted on in the larger house. Now generally the speaker of the house would distribute seats in this important committee to the oldest and most milquetoast members of his party. Don't want these guys rocking the boat. But because old boring moderates are at the core of Kevin McCarthy's voting base, he had to throw a bit of a bone to the younger more opinionated whippersnappers in his periphery. Now this includes a critical mass of voting seats in this incredibly important committee. It's suspected that Kevin McCarthy has agreed to a seat distribution in that committee where Democrats and moderate Republicans would have to work together to vote in alignment to override the Freedom Caucus's opinions. Now this revelation could see the House of Representatives being blocked from voting on a bill raising the debt ceiling or only being able to vote on a debt ceiling bill that's been loaded with amendments all attached by the House's conservative majority. Now that amended bill written by the conservative majority would then have to additionally be passed in the democrat controlled senate and then signed by the democratic president. Of course the other potential obstruction point would be allowing one member of the party to trigger a motion to vacate. Now this has been talked a lot about and it isn't exactly the grand concession that most people are making out to be. Actually, this was the house rules for most of its history and only changed in 2015 when someone actually read it and tried to use it. Now it is a great way to waste a few days though. The house has to put everything else they're talking about on the back burner and get together and vote on whether to kick out the speaker or not. If a majority votes to kick out the speaker then congratulations we're back to where we were a few days ago with the house unable to do anything except vote, vote, and vote again for who can be the speaker so they can start working again. 
Now this concern is relevant to today's conversation because if any individual in McCarthy's party wanted to derail debt ceiling negotiations, they could trigger a vote to kick McCarthy out and potentially run the clock on debt repayment by triggering days and days of procedural votes without being able to get literally anything done. That quickly approaching deadline is not going to reschedule around your debates. Now time it right and you could stir up a whole whirlwind of crap. In the end, I still think the odds of defaulting because of the debt ceiling is pretty low, but we're primed for some next level tomfoolery in the coming weeks. With current taxing and spending estimates, it's predicted that things will come to a head in early July. So get ready to celebrate your independence day with a debate about how borrowing more money is essential to America's continued existence. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. If you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.